Inequality and Prosperity. I'm Philip Booth, and I'm Editorial and Program Director at the Institute of Economic Affairs. And I hope that this will be an interesting um, evening um, for the audience and for our panelists. Uh, but it's a particularly special night, perhaps I can just say, for, for Christian, um, because his IEA monograph, um, A New Understanding of Poverty, uh, rolled off the press uh, today. And this is available for um, five pounds reduced from the normal cover price of 12 pounds 50 um, after the end of this evening's um, uh, discussion. It will be available on, on the website uh, next week. Uh, Christian joins a distinguished role of IEA authors, including uh, Milton Friedman, Friedrich Hayek, um, 2009 Nobel Prize winner Eleanor Ostrom, and our next author, Gary Becker. Um, so we expect great things from our authors, uh, Christian, and we have a knack of picking future Nobel Prize winners uh, if our authors have not already got that honour when they write for us. Um, so on to tonight's um, panel discussion. I'm delighted to welcome our distinguished uh, panel of speakers. And we'll be speaking rather than alphabetically in the order of um, Will Shaw, uh, Christian Niemates, um, uh, Kitty Yosha, and uh, Chris Snowden. So, and I'll introduce everybody now and then um, uh, sit down and just let the speakers take the floor. Um, uh, Kitty has had an absolutely stunning career for somebody who wasn't born until... Arsenal won their first post-war double, <laughs> and um, prior to her election as a, a Labour MP, she worked for, for Britain in Europe, the Economist Intelligence Unit, and for the Centre for European Reform, and she was then elected as MP for Burnley in 2005, and uh, was a government minister in the Treasury and the Department for Work and Pensions. Um, after the end of her parliamentary term, uh, she went to become director of Demos, and under her directorship, Demos has commissioned a report um, on the concern about the effect of welfare on disabled people, uh, called Destination Unknown. Um, Will Straw, I, I apologise, I'm not uh, introducing people in, in the right order, but anyway, Will, Will Straw um, attended Oxford University, where he was president of Oxford University Student Union, and then he was a Fulbright scholar and earned a Master's in Public Administration at Columbia University. He's the founder and editor of Left Foot Forward, and he has recently joined IPPR, uh, where he is the Associate Director for Strategic Development. Uh, Christian Niemitz uh, joined the IEA in 2008 as uh, a Poverty Fellow. Uh, he studied uh, economics at Humboldt University and Salamanca University. Uh, and during his studies, he interned at the Central Bank of Bolivia and the National Statistics Office in Paraguay, and then at the IEA and then, after graduating, came to work at the IEA whilst also uh, undertaking a PhD in public policy at King's College London. Uh, Christopher Snowden um, studied history at Lancaster University, graduated in 1998, and he's an adjunct scholar at the Democracy Institute, um, and his first book was Velvet Glove, um, Iron Fist, and he's also author of The Spirit Level Delusion, which no doubt he'll refer to um, this evening. So, Will, if you'd like to kick us off. Thanks very much, Philip, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, but I asked to go first just so that we would all be on the same page. This is quite data heavy, um, but I'm under strict instructions to uh, speak for no more than 10 minutes. So my watch is here, and I'm sure Philip will uh, be very keenly watching his watch uh, and tell me to, to get, a, get a move on if I'm too slow. Um, I want to start off with the politics, because I think it's interesting that we're having this discussion at all. Um, I think this poster was actually a victory for Labour. Uh, in the sense that the Conservatives were plastered this all around the country, I'm sure all of you saw it. Uh, and this was essentially trying to uh, say uh, that it was Labour who hadn't achieved their objectives of, uh, of dealing with poverty and dealing with inequality. And this was something that the Conservative Party was going to do better with. So getting the Conservatives to engage, you, you'll remember at uh, the Conservative Party conference in 2009, Cameron said, uh, in a very in impassioned part of the speech, who made the poorest poorer, who left youth unemployment higher, who made inequality greater? No, not the wicked Tories. You, Labour, you're the ones that did, did this to our society. So Cameron at that stage was trying to, trying to reclaim some sense of dealing with poverty, dealing with social justice, dealing with inequality. I regard that as a victory for Labour in changing the terms of debate, even though, as we'll see, uh, they, they didn't achieve quite as much as they would have liked in government. So, so uh, what are the facts? Starting off with relative poverty, which I'm sure we're going to talk about uh, in some depth this evening. Um, 
On the two areas that the um, Labour government targeted, child poverty and pension of poverty, there were real improvements uh, in the number of people in poverty and the percentage. Um, this chart is taken from the IFS's annual report on poverty and inequality, so it's the most recent report. And you can see the drops there in poverty. Uh, in, in child poverty, uh, the aim to halve child poverty by 2010 was missed, but there was still progress, uh, although it slipped back in the, in the later years. Interestingly, though, in terms of overall measures of relative poverty, it only went down marginally from 14 million to 13.4 on the far right. Uh, that was because uh, there was very little change in the working, uh, working age parents uh, who were in poverty, and actually working age non-parents' um, poverty relatively went up. So the story for Labour was one of bringing down uh, these measures of relative poverty, but then an uptick uh, in the third term, which you can see very clearly uh, in that graph. What about absolute poverty? Well, well, this actually was a much greater success story, even though it wasn't uh, what most of the focus was on. Most of the headlines were about child poverty. Most of the reporting, most of the analysis was about relative poverty. But in terms of absolute poverty, you can see some quite, quite stark drops in uh, absolute poverty. The children, uh, it virtually halved. The pensioners, um, it fell by two thirds. Uh, and overall, um, it almost halved. So uh, a lot of work was done in lifting people out of absolute poverty. What about inequality? Well, the story essentially uh, of the um, Thatcher and post Thatcherite period is one of rising inequality. Uh, this again, like all the previous ones, is from the IFS's report on poverty and inequality, and it shows this uh, steady increase upwards. Um, th there was a, a, a sort of downturn in inequality, very marginal, uh, in the um, second period of Labour's time in office, and then it went up again. Uh, and that, uh, um, uh, we'll come on to the, something about that in a moment. But you can see here uh, that essentially there was a trend that was going up and up, despite the measures that the Labour government took. However, Britain, this isn't often told, did much better than most other countries. This is from an OECD report, and it shows what happened in terms of the change mid-80s to mid-90s, mid-90s to mid-2000s. Uh, and you can see that relative to other countries, there was a much more modest increase uh, in inequality than uh, in most other OECD countries. Uh, and uh, New Zealand, Finland, Portugal, and the United States at the top on, on the right graph are the ones that really had the biggest cumulative change in inequality. Uh, Britons did go up, but it was, it was marginal. And indeed, all, most of that increase from the mid-80s to the mid-2000s was during the Thatcher major period. It actually, on this measure, came down. Just to reinforce that, in terms of inequality, in terms of going back to that graph, Labour did better than the Tories. This shows how, across the income distribution, everyone broken down into percentiles of the income distribution, uh, how average annual income went up or went down. And you can see that under uh, the um, Conservative period, there's pretty much a, a line like this. So if the richer you are, the better you did. The poorer you were, the worse you did. Um, when I was... Uh, when I was uh, at, uh, at primary school in Lambeth in the 1980s, we were told Margaret Thatcher makes the rich richer and the poor poorer. That was true. Um, for Labour, it's a slightly different story. Um, there wasn't actually that much uh, for the people in the bottom 10%. There was quite a lot uh, for people in the top 10%. But between that 10 and 90, it basically the line goes the other way. So the poor, the, the, the relatively poor did better, and the relatively rich did worse. What about those three terms? You break down that chart I've just shown you into three terms, and you can see it really was a tale of three terms. Uh, in the first term, uh, it's pretty flatter across the, the whole of the distribution. The second term was very redistributive, with people at the bottom, right, right across the bottom, doing much better than people at the top. And the third one, Labour 3, actually starts to look a bit like that Thatcher period. So very different story in each of those three terms that Labour had in office. What about the long view on inequality? Um, this is a slightly different measure, um, which is taken from uh, a report that Danny Dawling of Sheffield University did. What this shows here uh, is the share of total national income received by the richest 1% in Britain, going right back to 1920. And what essentially you see is that those inequalities that were in place uh, after the First World War declined um, through the Great Depression, through the levelling out of the, um, of the Second World War, through the Attlee period uh, and, uh, and then starts to go up again in the 
late 1970s. This is a pattern that's true in a range of English-speaking countries. Um, those at the back probably won't be able to see which is which, but the pale green is the United States, uh, the UK is red, the United States has the most marked increase in inequality uh, at that last period. Uh, but, uh, but it's basically a story of doing this. Not true in what some people call social Europe. Uh, here's France, Germany, Netherlands and Switzerland, surprisingly, uh, and there you can just see pretty much a steady decline uh, in the percentage of uh, total income shared by the top 1%. What about inequalities in wealth? Uh, this is from, and, and the previous slides from John Hill's landmark study on uh, national equality. Uh, and this shows the total household wealth across the population for those in the bottom 10% and the top 90%. Uh, it's measured in thousands. The total wealth for the bottom, uh, average for the bottom 10% is 28,000, and for the top 10% uh, is 1.3 million. So uh, quite a radical gap there between top and bottom in terms of the stock of wealth that people have. So why should we care about this? I'm sure this is going to be the discussion this evening. I've only got a couple of slides here uh, to, to look at. But the first is just to have a quick word about the spirit level, which has been of much discussion. Uh, the IEA's website, and Philip and I had an exchange about this last week, said, many amongst the left have welcomed recent work that suggested that we should be less concerned with eliminating poverty than eliminating inequality, even if this makes the poor poorer. Um, I asked Philip, you know, what is this? great left-wing text that I haven't read and I don't know about that says it's okay to make the poor poorer. And Philip said it was the spirit level. I emailed Richard Wilkinson and said, is this true? Is this what your book says? Uh, and he says, you're right, we don't say anything like that. Uh, and uh, and uh, he says, sounds like the IA being a bit naughty. So I don't want to dwell on that too much, but I think there is, <laughs> I think there is a little bit of um, uh, a, a misrepresentation of what the spirit level is about. I should say now that I don't buy all the conclusions of the spirit level. I think it is much better as a study showing a correlation between societal problems uh, and income inequality than it proves any causation. So there's been a big debate, and I'm sure we'll hear more about this from Chris, about whether their correlations are robust. Uh, my view, having looked at the arguments on both sides, uh, is that they are, and we can come back to that. What I don't buy from Wilkinson and Pickett is this idea that if you reduce inequality, you will necessarily get an improvement in those social uh, outcomes. I don't think they've proved that at all. Um, so, so why should we care, then, if, if there isn't a straightforward causation argument? Well, first of all, from a democratic point of view, the public care about it. This is from the British Social Attitudes Survey. You will have read in the press that uh, recently that the uh, percentage of people who think that um, we should be redistributing income has fallen. That's the dotted line there. It's absolutely true. That, that impression has fallen. Uh, so people don't necessarily will that means of uh, reducing in income inequality, but they do, uh, they do will the ends, which is saying the income gap is too large. That's pretty robust, going right back to the mid-80s. 80% uh, of the population saying that we should do something about this, just not sure what. Um, so, so why should we care about inequality? S starting very briefly with the top. What we can see here, it's a graph I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It shows how uh, the um, earnings of those at the very top have gone much faster over a 40-year period than people in the middle or at the bottom of the income distribution. Uh, I think there's a straightforward economic efficiency argument, which I'm sure will appeal to the IEA, which is that the marginal propensity to consume is much higher for those at the bottom of the income scale. So I think there's a strong argument that some of this extra income is being uh, wasted in going to these, um, these uh, people at the top. If you then look at this, which goes even deeper into what's happening at the top, and you can see that uh, for the top 0.5%, so the top 200th of the population, now earning uh, 600 um, uh, on, a, on a scale six times what the, um, what the average person earns. And that has gone up very dramatically over an extended period of time. Uh, and I think, again, it, the super-rich are now able to essentially um, step out of British society in a way I think is, is quite worrying, quite troubling. I'm not sure that this increase in um, earnings at the top um, does much for the British economy. A lot of them are taking their money out of Britain. Uh, and I think that um, there's also problems in what it does with solidarity. And I'm sure we can come on to those questions later on. Finally, Emerson's philosophy, if the, if the data and the facts don't get you, maybe the philosophy will. Um, a lot of you will know about rules and his difference principle, about the idea of social and economic inequalities, the arranged so they're both to the greatest benefit of the least advantage. That, to me, is something 
that has always driven the work that I've done. But, um, but more than that, I think, for those of you who are attached to the American Dream, this is from Trollo, who wrote the original text on the American Dream in 1931. It's a wonderful piece of text. This is how I'll end. That dream of a land in which life should be better and richer and fuller for every man, with opportunity for each according to ability or achievement. It is not a dream of motor cars and high wages merely, but a dream of social order in which each man and each woman should be able to attain to the fullest stature of which they are innately capable and be recognised by others for what they are, regardless of the peculiar circumstances of birth or position. I think as society gets more unequal, the ability to be socially mobile and move up that ladder becomes harder because the rungs are further apart. And to me, that's the reason we should care about inequality. Thanks very much. Well, if you want to know something about poverty, the most obvious place to start is looking at people's consumption patterns, looking at people what actually what people actually buy and not at income ratios. And uh, on consumption patterns, we've got data going back to the year 1957. And in that year, an average household in Britain was spending a third of its total budget on food alone, and another tenth on clothing. So that's a big share of the total household budget going on very basic necessities. Let's compare that now to the year 2008, but let's ignore average households. Let's look specifically at the poorest 10%, bottom of the income distribution, bottom decile. You can see here that uh, in 2008, households in that decile were spending only 17% of their total budget on food and only 5% on clothing. So that means that compared to an average household in the 50s, a poor household today has substantial spare resources which they can spend on other things. And in particular, they are spending around 11% of their budgets on um, activities, services related to recreation, culture, They're spending another 7% on eating out and staying in hotels, and 4% on communication services. So in a sense, we can say the poor today are leading more comfortable lives than the middle classes did two generations ago. And that is without counting that life expectancy has also increased by more than eight years across the board, and that annual working hours have fallen by more than 300 hours per employed person. A related way of looking at this is uh, looking at household possession or access to essential goods and services. For example, the share of households who can afford meals with meat, poultry, fish at least every other day is over 95%. Share of households with an indoor lavatory is 99%. Same goes for washing machines. And virtually every household in the country has a telephone, at least one telephone. Virtually every household has at least one TV set. And practically everybody has an indoor shower. So um, <coughs> if early researchers on poverty, like Benjamin Rountree or Joseph Rountree, if they could see those figures, they would certainly be hugely <coughs> impressed I'm sure they would not be concerned then talking about the share of income that goes to the top percent or the top per mill. Now, Will mentioned relative poverty, which is very high in this country, that is true. Trouble is, relative poverty is a somewhat strange measure. What we see here is how relative poverty has evolved over the last half century. And we can see here relative Poverty was rather constant in uh, the 1960s and 70s. And then we get a sudden explosion in the 1980s, and we see poverty never fully recovering from that level. But taking a second look, there are a few irritating things in this graph. For example, this passage here is the impact of the first world oil crisis. And we can see measured poverty actually fell during the crisis, which is logical if you think about what relative poverty is. And if the poverty line is attached to average incomes, well, in a recession and a crisis, average incomes fall. 
That's why we get this falling measured poverty here during the first world oil crisis. And we see the same thing happening again during the second oil crisis and the recession of the early 80s. And if we look at the recession of the early 90s, we see again falling poverty. So in a sense, if the government is really absolutely keen on meeting the child poverty targets, the easiest way to achieve that would be to create a permanent recession. <laughs> There's one thing which relative poverty figures do track very well, very accurately, and that is, of course, inequality. This uh, darker blue line here, I'm not sure if you can see that in the back, that is inequality. And this is comparing relative poverty to inequality, and we can see that uh, the two measures track each other almost perfectly. So, much of the conventional wisdom on poverty is questionable. But, however, having said all that, none of this means that uh, poverty is not a serious issue today. Poverty is still with us. It is less severe than it was in former times, but it is still there, and it is appropriate that it should be a policy focus, but probably not in the way that it currently is, because the reasons are a bit different. My first slide was indicating that uh, the poor today have to spend less, proportionately, on food and clothing than they did in earlier times. That is a great development. Unfortunately, there are spending items for which the exact opposite is true. And that is specifically true for housing. This blue column here shows housing costs as a proportion, as a share of uh, poor people's budgets, the budgets of uh, people in the tenth, at the 10th percentile of the income distribution, and we see a rise in 20 over time. That is totally counterintuitive. In a growing economy, we should observe the opposite. We would expect that people spend less and less on housing proportionately relative to the size of their budget, and we see the opposite happening. And why does that happen? Well, it's got nothing to do with scarcity of land. Uh, this is not a genuine scarcity signal. This is the result of a policy failure. This has to do with supply side constraints. And this is especially the result of an overly restrictive land use planning system. Now, so if the government wants to do something for the poor, single most effective reform would then be to thoroughly liberalize the land use planning system so that the supply side of the housing market can adapt to the high housing demand <coughs> and bring down that the cost of housing to at least average European levels. Now, what this shows here is only the direct effect of high housing costs. There are also numerous knock-on effects. So this would surely be the single most effective thing and one which has no uh, fiscal cost, would even have fiscal savings. On a second issue, uh, we sometimes hear that the most straightforward way to reduce poverty is to increase social spending, that uh, the UK should be more Scandinavian or more continental European. Well, this is social spending as a percentage of GDP. This is just a big aggregate lumping everything together. And on that measure, the UK belongs to the top group already right? in terms of net social protection benefits. So um, I'm not going to comment on whether that is good or bad. That is a separate debate. But I think what this shows is you cannot make the case that uh, the UK simply has to become more like Scandinavia and that that will solve all problems. Because at least in terms of aggregate social spending, in aggregate terms, the UK is already a lot like Scandinavia. If 25% of GDP is not enough, then how much is? The difference uh, between the UK and other countries in Europe is uh, somewhere else. This shows the proportion of children who live in households with nobody in work. And UK here, probably not readable from the back, comes easily on top. So that's uh, more than 17% of all children in this country live in a household with nobody in work, well above the European average. And that is uh, particularly troubling because 
This uh, figure includes a lot of countries where overall unemployment is a lot higher. So it's not that unemployment is particularly high here, but it's unusually concentrated and it affects the weakest groups. So uh, it's more, it's less about um, ag aggregate social spending, but rather about the structure of, um, of the benefit system. I'm just quickly going to allude to that. Uh, this is the effect of means testing. Um, it shows withdrawal rates generated through uh, the means testing of benefits. And even under the new universal credit, um, which is already an improvement compared to today, it will still be true that uh, for most people, uh, the effective marginal tax rate uh, will be about 76%, which is way above top marginal, uh, top uh, explicit income tax rates, even in Sweden and Denmark. So, to summarize quickly, poverty is a lot less severe than it was in earlier times. It made massive improvements, and that is the fruit of economic progress, of course. But, nevertheless, poverty is still there. It's just that it should probably be addressed by other means than the ones um, most commonly discussed, and that is liberalizing product markets, especially the housing market, but the same applies to other markets, and make sure that we break up the poverty trap and uh, reform the welfare system. Thank you. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, to be here. Very important uh, debate that we're having. I'm going to argue that both the previous speakers are entirely missing the point. Um, and I think the best way to pro probably describe it is to take two statistics that you just heard. One from Will, who said that, quite rightly, uh, the number of children in poverty, whether it be absolute po poverty or relative uh, poverty, has fallen quite dramatically uh, in the last uh, 10 to 15 years or so, which is something that we must all uh, celebrate. But Christian has just showed us very uh, clearly uh, the worrying uh, data that shows that the number of children in workless households is still very high, certainly by European standards, though we didn't see the uh, US uh, data uh, there, which is very disturbing. And I think we need to work out why it is that we are disturbed by the fact that clearly there are children who are not living in poverty, perhaps, but are living in workless households. And we've had a, 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 a sort of initial uh, uh, discussion from Christian about the way that the benefit system doesn't work. And that's because although income is very important, it's actually important because of a signal it's sending about other aspects of people's lives. And I think if we have a medium-term aim on the whole poverty uh, debate, it should be, you know, what actually is poverty apart from income, important though that is. Because I'll tell you what gets me about this kind of debate. The reason I feel sad when I see the number of children living in workless households is not necessarily because they are poor, but because they have less access to opportunity, less broader vision of the type of lives that could be had because they don't have role models of people in work mixing with other adults and um, uh, doing things in the economic sphere to the same uh, extent. The things that make me sad are the connection that's very clear and still there, although it has been breaking down recently, um, between your parents' income and your own life chances, your parents' class and your own life chances, the town that you were born and the amount of uh, income that you will have in later life, the relationship between income and your parents' income and your health. And surely that is, it is the um, inequality in health outcomes that we should be more concerned with rather than, uh, and the relationship that that has with income, rather than purely income in itself. And I'm going to argue that we need to be far clearer in asking people what it is that they want from their lives, and what it is in their lives that they feel is fair and unfair, and precisely the type of sentiment that we heard in um, Will's American uh, quote towards the end of uh, his presentation. And perhaps to do another American example, I think it was the founding fathers when they wrote the American Constitution that mentioned the pursuit of happiness as being um, critical to people's sense of self-esteem. Now, I immediately had an enormous ha uh, caveat that just, um, that, you know, one should not talk about happiness and well-being uh, uh, in a way that t attempts to crowd out the fact that the poverty indicators are all going the wrong way. But I think what I'm trying to demonstrate is that there are psychological aspects of this that have to be taken account of. Otherwise, we'll simply be targeting uh, the wrong thing. So, by means of uh, context, um, 
Demos, the think tank that uh, uh, I run, which is a, a critical friend of the IEA, and we love uh, debating uh, each other, um, has recently set out a scoping piece of research on how one might define a multi-dimensional uh, measure of poverty. Um, some of my friends uh, on the left were initially extremely hostile to this idea, presuming that it was an attempt to sort of draw a veil over uh, redistributive uh, methods, not at all. It's much more about focusing uh, on what really matters uh, to people. There's an enormous amount of data out there about what society is saying uh, that it wants, and we hope this year to be launching a substantial piece of work uh, that enables us to weight various different aspects of people's lives in order to have a, a better understanding uh, of the opportunities that they want. So, for example, we should not only be, uh, be looking at income, will, and consumption, uh, Christian, but also material deprivation, which is partially in the policy debate already, um, financial well-being, um, the relationship between assets and income, intertemporal issues, um, you know, somebody uh, who has a very low income but might have a house to live in, or somebody that has a low income but might have, uh, you know, re realistic expectations that they will have a higher income in future, one might say in a very different situation uh, to somebody who has a low income uh, and feels trapped. Um, family, social networks and interactions might sound very soft and woolly, but when you look at actually what people say gives them life satisfaction, having support and being part of some type of community, even interestingly if it's a virtual community, um, is extremely important to people as they seek support and solutions to the, fam to the situations they find them themselves in. Behaviours uh, and attitudes towards environmental issues may or may not uh, be a concern, needs to be taken, uh, 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 needs to be explored. Illicit and risky behaviour, crime, drug use, antisocial behaviour may make a huge difference to the extent to which someone feels that their life is rich or their life uh, is poor. And of course, all the issues around opportunity, which I'm uh, surprised have not been drawn out more, Christian, in the IEA uh, work. Education, human capital, skills, access to skills. Uh, access to progression. A survey that I'm very keen to do is to ask people to what extent they feel that they could progress at work. Because somebody who feels they could progress at work is in a similar category, actually, to somebody who is at university studying for the future because it's a hopeful situation. They feel they have control of their lives and able to shape them uh, as compared to somebody who doesn't feel uh, that they are able to progress at work. What are the barriers to that and what is the government policy um, in, uh, uh, in response. Health outcomes, obviously, and um, attitudes and expectations are all part of a potential multi-dimensional uh, measure of poverty. Um, and if I can draw on perhaps some work that has already started us off, uh, a, a former Labour cabinet minister who some, on, if you don't mind me uh, saying, well, our side of the fence might see to be a traitor for doing work for the uh, coalition government, namely Frank Field's report um, on uh, a wider definition of poverty very much drew out uh, the importance of looking at the early years experience of children in determining their future outcomes and that any um, discussion of uh, poverty needs to be viewed through this prism uh, precisely because it is sort of opportunity and potential that is critical to this debate and is not in uh, any particular way captured in these statistics. It's perfectly possible, for example, due to benefit transfers, that a child might be lifted out of absolute or relative poverty, but if they do not then have the opportunity for whatever reason, even in the development of their own character, to, to, to get the most out of life to achieve that American dream we heard from in Will's presentation, um, uh, then what use is it really in the longer term, except insofar as they've had um, balanced uh, meals in their early years, which must have an effect uh, on, their, on their health. So he's proposing things like parenting classes throughout the school life, really important understanding of the role of early years in developing your character. Let me just give you an example, and this is something that Demos has been looking at through its character inquiry in the last couple of years uh, as well. If your character develops in a way that means that when you are an adult, you are able to be resilient when something terrible happens to you, and let's face it, something terrible is gonna happen to every single one of us at some stage, throughout our adult life, where it be where, you know, some kind of shock, whether it's simply a bereavement, <laughs> something awful like a bereavement, or whether you lose your job, or you get buffeted by something you feel totally out of control of. What is it that makes some people rebound, and others become dependent? 
And where does that resilience come from? And all the evidence is showing that it's coming from um, early, early years formative experience. So if our anti-poverty strategies were not developed on a traditional sort of welfare uh, uh, financial model, but actually looking at what builds resilient people, then in time you'll have far fairer outcomes because there's nothing about the place you were born or the class you were born into that in any way determines uh, your resilience. It's your early years uh, experiences. So that's another sort of way that this this area, this approach to poverty is beginning um, to have traction through Frank Field's uh, report. And um, at the risk of sounding too um, like a, a, a stock record in terms of early years um, experiences, we on Monday launched a piece of work that was not in any way intended to look at the poverty uh, debate called the Home Front. It was uh, a, a, a piece of family policy research that was employing all sorts of different types of survey techniques and also ethnographic um, sort of social science research where um, we had people as fly on the walls in individual households working out what effect of different types of parenting style based on the presumption that um, uh, you know, sort of consistent boundaries in childhood develop this resilient type of character. And we found that it's um, prevalent all the way up and down the uh, social scale and income scale, but obviously if you uh, are finding it more stressful as a parent while you are working, then you're going to have less emotional uh, capacity to provide that type of tough love that is um, perceived as leading to more resilient um, adults uh, uh, who, who have had that type of childhood uh, experience. So that is the way in, I think, to this uh, debate, because those people who are working hard to make ends meet and are the working poor are also those who are more likely to have children who are not developing the resilient character characteristics that will mean that they are able to succeed in later life. And of course, there are lots of other things as well, education opportunities, mentors, and so on. But there's something about character and the way that that develops if you're living in a household that is finding life stressful when children are young. And it, that immediately leads to policy conclusions that doing things like having greater control over working hours when your parents are young, and Nick Clegg used it as, an, as, a, as a sort of a, a, a peg to launch um, what he wanted to say on paternity leave, um, and ensuring uh, that, uh, you know, let's be slightly controversial here, that uh, families are supported to, in the way that they bring up children, and also that men and women are equally supported so that parents where, families where two parents work, the women aren't doing kind of double shift, they're working in, at work and then they're working at home because the father is increasingly sort of working harder and harder and harder to try and make ends meet. It's that type of policy that in the medium term is actually going to lead to better uh, distributional outcomes because it's going to make it more possible for more people to climb up um, through the opportunity uh, trail. Um, so to try and summarise all of this and perhaps to move us on to uh, the next speaker, um, I just want to give you maybe one or two sentences my take on the spirit level, uh, which is uh, there is a clear uh, correlation, I agree, but not necessarily one of causation between various societal outcomes and income inequality. The spirit level um, seems to try and imply that we're, if we're all equal, then we're going to have better health outcomes. I might sort of say, uh, turn that around uh, the other way, that if we all have better health outcomes and other societal things are better, we will end up more equal as a result. Thank you.